So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, my name is Janina Chrisman. I am the uh, head of career development here at Macaulay Honors College. Really, really appreciate that both Julianne and Saad are joining us today to speak to you all a little bit more about the Edgewood Management uh, Summer Internship Program. So take it away, Julianne and Saad. Okay, great. I, I guess I'll start. Saad, so we are an investment advisory firm, so we, uh, which means that we invest capital on behalf of in, on behalf of individuals and foundations, endowments, corporations, with the goal that we will do a better. We can charge them a fee for investing their money because we will do a better job and um, get them better performance than they would do on their own. So. Uh, we run a summer internship program, which I believe you have all the details of, and we will answer any questions about that at the end of this, but we wanted to talk a little bit about Edgewood and what we do. So I work in the compliance department and Saad is um, one of our senior analysts. So take it away, Saad. Hey, thanks, Julianne. Um, hey, everyone. It's so nice to meet you. Uh, thanks for making the time to, uh, lear to learn a little bit more about Edgewood. And so, you know, I think really this is your time. We want to be as helpful as we can. Uh, we have a, a presentation and we found like, you know, historically it's been useful to maybe flip through some slides and use those as discussion points, but we really don't want to make it like a rote session. So, you know, we won't, you know, talk to each slide for the entire hour. Maybe we'll flip through a few and then uh, really kind of pencils down on the presentation uh, to leave enough time for Q&A and make it interactive. So, um, Maybe with that, if it's okay, I'll try to screen share um, to, to start the, the presentation. So, okay. Who's gonna be the brave student to turn their video on? I know, yeah. I know, I feel so vulnerable right now. <laughs> Okay, everyone, you can see that? I'm gonna I, assume. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, great. Okay, so um, uh, so what does Edgewood do, right? Um, oops, sorry. Okay, so uh, in the world, there are literally trillions of dollars of cash. Um, uh, some estimates are somewhere between 60 to $100 trillion of cash. Uh, and now, you know, you could the, uh, put that cash under sofas, but the issue becomes is that if you do that, the, the amount that you can buy using that cash will degrade over time, right? Because there's this thing called inflation and prices of things uh, uh, keep going up. And so if that cash is left uninvested and not earning a return, uh, when you uh, wake up you know, five years from now, uh, you'll be able to uh, purchase less of the goods and services you need to, or you'll be able to, you won't, uh, you won't be able to you know, give the pension payments that you intended to uh, because the, uh, the cost of money is continually rising. The cost of goods is continually rising. So, um, investing very broad brush is uh, is basically the practice of investing all this cash that's on the sidelines into different types of assets so that the value of the, those investments grow over time and as the value of that grows over time the owner of that cash will be able to you know take the amount of that growth and invest it in whatever they need to invest it in, which you know, oftentimes is you know, the pension payments for people who are part of their pension plan um, or the payments for you know, financial assistance if I'm a university endowment, right? So that's why we exist. We, we are one very, very tiny sliver of this overall industry whose purpose is to return, to earn a return on the cash that people have accumulated so that they can meet their future obligations. Now, there's many, many, many different ways to invest. And I think uh, a, a helpful analogy is, if you think about medicine, there are many, many, many different types of ways to practice medicine. You know, my uh, brother is a cardiologist, someone else can be a dentist, someone can be a psychiatrist, someone can be a surgeon, 
um, someone can be, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, and so just like there's so many different ways to practice medicine, there's many different ways to invest. You can invest in, you know, I'm sure people might want to talk about like things like Bitcoin, or you can invest in art, you can in invest in land and real estate. What we do is we invest in stocks and stocks are just the way to think about it, like a fractional ownership of a corporation. Okay. And so really what we do is we invest in businesses and uh, the type of business we invest in are what we classify as like high growth companies. So these are companies that are going after a really large opportunity with, through which they can grow. And we consider them to be very kind of high quality businesses that can sustain their position in whatever they do for long periods of time. And so as they chase their prizes, they will grow and our investment in them will then also proportionately grow over time. So kind of, you know, what is growth? You know. A growth is really, you know, basically a bet on change happening in society. So, you know, uh, a, a, there's a new company that's formed or an existing company creates a new product or they're going after a new market or they're embracing a new technology. And so our job really is to understand change that's occurring in society. Um, and the way we like to think about it is we get paid to dream about how the world's going to be. You know, our job literally is to kind of visualize, you know, where is the world headed in five or 10 years? What are the big waves of change that are going to occur? And once we identify those big waves, uh, let's go out and, and try to identify the companies that are going to ride those waves the best. Um, so it sounds a little esoteric, but we like to consider ourselves as dreamers. Um, and so this is uh, another like a way to maybe illustrate the point. So, you know, a massive, massive you know, wave that occurred in the 1900s was electricity, okay? It was invented in the early 1900s um, as a way to light people's homes, um, but then it created so many knock-on effects that it was this source of change that you know, carried society for 100 years. Right, so you began lighting homes, but then you also created the industry or the demand for appliances in the home. Um, you then created things like TV, which enabled an entire global media industry. You uh, created the computer, which obviously then enabled you know, the internet. You created wireless telecommunications. And so uh, it became so, uh, so important in society that it basically became the background of society. And so, you know, you went, like I'm sure someone in 1930 was classifying companies or industries as these are the electricity companies and these are the non-electricity companies. But over time, clearly it became something that uh, everyone uh, participated in. Either you were a kind of, the only real distinction became, are you kind of a pure play provider of electricity or is this something that you embrace that's part of your, you know, the rest of your business, but it, it, electricity became the enabler of everything. Um, and so, you know, just as electrification created like a hundred year growth opportunity, you know, we uh, assert and believe, and I think obviously it's not, uh, it's a very obvious point um, that computing is kind of the hundred year growth opportunity of our era, right? And we're as much as uh, uh, computing has changed our lives, there's still so much yet to, to be changed. Um, and so, you know, we began with the PC, then there was the internet, and there was the smartphone. Um, and so each of these kind of uh, sources of change within computing solved new problems, addressed new unmet needs, helped us do certain things better. But as much as, excuse me, but as much as uh, the world has changed and our phone can allow us to get from point A to point B and and uh, and get food delivered and um, and talk to our best friends and watch entertainment. Um, but there's still so many things that hasn't solved, right? Um, uh, we, we haven't, uh, we, the way we go to the doctor is the same as it was 20 years ago where we go wait in, um, in a waiting area, like completely unnecessarily for like two hours before we go see her. Um, you know, the way we go to school has completely, pretty much not change at all. Uh, um, the way, you know, the way we access our banks and our bank account information is changing somewhat, but still kind of in its nascency. So, uh, you know, as much as 
uh, technology has changed our lives. We think there's still as much that it hasn't changed. And so we are very fascinated and excited about all the other areas that's going to change in our lives. And through those um, kind of changes, new businesses will be formed. And that's kind of what we do. Um, so yeah, so a little bit about Edgewood. Um, um, uh, so we, uh, you know, our firm, we have two offices, uh, one based in uh, Midtown, New York City, and one based in Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, we have uh, 40 employees in total. Um, we've been in existence since 1974, and so we're really proud of that fact. Uh, you know, in the investment industry, in the financial services industry, it's kind of rare for business to have such a longevity, and so we're super proud of that. Um, we um, currently... The amount of money, you know, I like told you there's like $60 trillion of capital out there. You know, we just all, uh, manage a certain small slice of that, which is still a large number in absolute terms, which is uh, in excess of $60 billion of capital. Um, this is our investment team, but the investment team is just one aspect of, you know, the overall business of Edgewood. You know, we have people who are on the investment team. We have people who are on the trading team who help take the ideas that we have sitting at our desks and actually go out and buy the stocks we need to buy. We have a marketing team that helps us uh, get new clients. We have an operations and administrative team that uh, really help manage the relationships with our clients. We have a compliance team uh, where uh, Julianne works in, which is really on top of ensuring that everything we're doing is um, in concert with the ever increasing complexity of, of the rules and regulations. And, and more more recently is working on you know ESG um, uh, our ESG practices which stands for kind of environmental uh, sustainable and governance uh, practices. Um, so I'm trying to think um, you know what uh, because I do really want to maximize the amount of time for questions. So I'm going to now kind of skip over slides and just sort of pause on ones that I think are relevant. Um, and so this um, is um, uh, an illustration of the companies that we own, right? So just like there's many different type ways to invest, you know, there's many different strategies. Some companies, some firms might own hundreds of businesses. You know, we have found just like in life that you can only have a massive insight seldomly. Uh, similarly, with investing, you only come across like a really big idea once in a while. And so hence, there's a lot of value in having a focused approach to investing um, where you bet big on a selective number of ideas. And when you have a selective number of ideas, your ability to know them really well is also much better rather than us chasing around, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of companies. So these are companies that we believe fit the, the description that I provided earlier. They're very high quality in nature, meaning, um, you know, we believe they can very they can sustain their position in their respective industries against the competition, and they're going after really large opportunities, uh, uh, which will allow them to grow for long periods of time. So there's some companies that you might uh, uh, definitely probably haven't heard of, such as like uh, IHS Market or CME Group or American Tower, um, and you know these are examples of businesses that um, you know enable a lot of the things that you use on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and then there's obviously companies that you definitely have heard and for whose services you use on a regular basis, like you know Microsoft, Estee Lauder, uh, um, Amazon, Nike, Snapchat, Netflix, Chipotle. Um, so we hope you eat lots of burritos for our sake, otherwise Julianne and I won't have a job to come back to. Um, so this gives you a sense of the types of companies we own. Um, again, this is a depiction of our team. Um, I'm going to breeze through a little bit of this section. And so, you know how we talked about um, each wave of computing solves new problems. Um, and so an example of this is, you know, when, the, when everyone got a computer on their desk, they were able to start, you know, typing up uh, documents or using, um, you know, spreadsheets, which enhance their productivity as an individual or as a business. Um, so that gave birth to Microsoft. Uh, the internet happened and there was an explosion of websites. And so therefore there was a need for, to kind of work for a business to orchestrate how individuals access information that, that gave birth to search. Um, with the smartphone, uh, the big unlock was, uh, 
your location could be utilized and there could be services built utilizing your location. Um, and so many location-based apps were enabled, the most famous of which is obviously ride hailing and Uber. And it, you know, the arc of computing doesn't stop there. You know, there's a very famous uh, venture capitalist, John Doerr, who was one of the first investors in Google, who's coined this idea that you know, every 13 years, there are these tech tsunamis. And we're on the cusp of a new tech tsunami. So you know, I'm sure you've heard the buzzwords thrown around, machine learning or artificial intelligence. We're now talking about you know, the metaverse and augmented reality. You know, whatever buzzword society ends up you know, you know, you know, uh, uh, finalizing on, settling on, the, the fact remains is that you know, the power of computing, the speed of computing, the intelligence of computing is just going to keep getting better. The immersiveness and personal, uh, the, the intimacy of computing is going to keep getting deeper and deeper, and that's just going to be able to enable uh, new services. So one example of that is, you know, uh, I'm curious, how many of you guys uh, uh, use Spotify to listen to music? Uh, so, I, okay, so a few of you, right? Um, and so do you guys, the people who use Spotify, do you guys use, um, listen to playlists? Like some of those pre-programmed pr playlists? Got it. You know, it's really hard to hear you when you're muted. I kind of use playlists, uh, not too often. You know, if I find a song I like, I just add it to my own playlist and, and okay. that's that. Okay, cool. Uh, Albert, you were uh, you were nodding viciously. <laughs> yeah, I, I mainly construct my own playlist. I would say. Got it. But yeah, got it. Okay, cool. So uh, that's pr that's the norm. But you know, from a company wide level, like thirty percent of um, uh, thirty percent of listening is done through playlists, which are all algorithmically created. So that's like a real world example of how. Uh, machine learning, basically the computer listens to your history, right? Uh, understands the types of songs you like, and then predictively recommends songs that will fit your case, right? And that's a machine learning problem. And that's an example of how machine learning is enabling, uh, you know, discovery, the, the idea of curation to you. And so that's an example of how, you know, this next wave of computing will help solve a different type of problem. Uh, you know, this I think is an important slide to uh, to talk about, to talk to, and it's like a reflection of the slide I showed, which shows our different um, company investments. But you know, we bet on big waves, right? So some of the ways we bet on are the shift to cloud computing, or you know, the shift away from you know people watching TV on their cable boxes to other ways people consume uh, content. Obviously, online uh, purchasing. Um, you know, people. Uh, accessing financial services digitally, also the intersection of healthcare and technology. So these are the big waves uh, that we identify, and then these are companies that express those waves, right? And so then going into the details of each is, I, I think, less important. Um, you know, maybe one that I might call out is uh, we talked about discovery already, but you know, healthcare is an area that we're super excited about and very intrigued by, right? And so. You know, healthcare is a perfect example of an industry where, you know, it pretty much is um, operating the way it has been for decades, even though everything else we consume or purchase has been really, uh, you know, mediated um, through technology. And so, uh, you know, one aspect of healthcare, which we think could change is um, this idea of genomics. Okay. And so, uh, uh, maybe one way to think about it is you, you, in our body, um, the most like kind of embryonic aspect or building block of our body is the cell. Or, or, and then if you keep drilling it down, it's like your DNA. And your DNA ultimately is just a compilation of four types of amino acids, okay? Um, and uh, it is, uh, you know, A, T, C, G, which are the initials of each of those amino acids. Um, and just slight variations of those, of how, of the sequence of those amino acids um, dictate different uh, structures in the body, dictate different species. It's the difference between monkeys and, 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 and human beings. It dictates whether you have a disease or not. And so, 
uh, a huge area of focus within the healthcare community is can we get better at reading the sequence of those amino acids or reading the sequence of your DNA? And once we get, once we're able to read it, can we start doing interesting things with it? Can we isolate the sequence that causes certain diseases? Uh, and then once we can, so, you know, we started reading it. So now we can maybe start interpreting it. Once we have started to interpret it, could we actually go a step further and start editing it? So maybe rather than us getting sick and then taking medications to kind of numb the pain, could we kind of more foundationally go into your DNA, you know, take out the sequence of genes um, that, uh, that are like kind of incorrect and replace them with a corrected level of genes so that you, the disease never comes in your body to begin, to, to begin with. You know, so this growth in genetic sequencing is really fascinating to us. You know, we have owned a company called Illumina, which makes basically uh, the reader, which is you, know, you take a, a blood test, you put it through the machine and it spits out your sequence of genes. Um, uh, and now as that's gotten cheaper and cheaper, this is sort of the cost of genetic sequencing. You know, it, it cost a hundred million bucks per genome 20 years ago, it now costs, uh, it, it, it now costs, you know, less, you know, going on towards hundred dollars per genome. As it gets cheaper and cheaper and more and more people are able to get their gene sequenced, um, can we start doing more interesting things with it? Like I was talking about, which is, you know, not just reading it, but understanding, interpreting it and ultimately fixing it. Um, so, you know, that's an area that we're really fascinated by. Um, and my screen has stalled. Uh, okay. Um, you know, I'm trying to think. Yeah, and and I think that's probably a good stopping point. I mean, there's a lot of more detail here. Um, maybe I can just harp on this a little bit. This is, um, and then we'll stop. But uh, it's, you know, ask yourself the question. Obviously, we're talking in the context of a summer internship and maybe thought maybe it might be helpful to give you a little insight of what exactly our day-to-day -day job is, right? It's like if you were to be here full time, what would you do? Uh, so, you know, when we think of an idea, right, um, our view is we need to go understand that business better than anyone else. And historically, we found that when you're evaluating whether or not to invest in a given business, there's also always like a central question or a series of questions um, that um, uh, th that is worthwhile, that needs to be answered to understand the future of the business. And so then what we do is go out and do a lot of kind of field research, a lot of primary research um, kind of in the field to develop a sense or a view as to where those questions are headed, okay? And the important thing to note is, you know, there's a huge premium placed on quantitative abilities and we would agree like, you know, being really analytical is super important, but to us, that's just table stakes. Um, the more value added um, uh, research is, uh, is marrying the quantitative with a lot of qualitative kind of soft research um, where you kind of take yourself out, out of a situation, take your bias out of a situation and just go out almost like a, an investigative reporter and talk to people uh, who interact with the business that you're studying to see, uh, you know, how to, to, to kind of get a sense of the, the answers to the questions you're thinking about. So like, you know, an example could be Netflix, right? So we invested in Netflix six years ago. Um, at the time we invested in Netflix, uh, you know, the, the, the stock was, uh, I, I would say it was a, a hotly debated stock, right? And really the debate on Netflix um, or the questions you had to answer was at the time, uh, does Netflix have the ability to raise pricing, right? And Two, does Netflix have appeal to people outside the United States, right? So we could have all the opinions we have, we want, but ultimately those would just be opinions. So what we wanted to do is go to the source and speak with actual customers to gauge a sense of what the answers to those questions would be. So for example, in the case of 
pricing power for Netflix. We pulled you know, hundreds of subscribers in the US to get a sense like, hey, would you drop your service if the price of Netflix raised uh, was increased by 50 cents, by a dollar, by three dollars, et cetera. And you know, as, a, as an aside, we found, thought the most interesting uh, feedback was that I think something like 30% of the people who subscribe to Netflix don't even know how much they pay which gives you a sense that like if Netflix slipped in like an extra 50 cents, no one would really be uh, the wiser. Um, and the, the other uh, question that was really important is that, you know, will people outside the US oh, uh, want to watch Netflix? And in particularly in like uh, in other countries and regions where the per capita income is low, there's a, been historic, a historical narrative that people don't aren't willing to pay for content and entertainment. Um, and so, uh, you know, we went out and, and pulled like, I think a thousand, um, you know, internet users from everywhere, literally from, you know, Brazil to Malaysia and in between and India uh, to gauge people's willingness to pay for a service like Netflix if Netflix were to launch in their market. And it turned out like 70% or more people were willing to subscribe, which was really um, kind of encouraging and reinforcing to us. And so, you know, so we took those pieces of research, A, that Netflix has the ability to raise pricing, and B, that Netflix has appeal for uh, people outside the United States. And then we married that into our financial analysis by, you know, uh, okay, so that means that it can grow by X amount, and that then spits out um, kind of a, a view of what we think they, they can, you know, their profits that they can generate over time, and then therefore what the stock should be worth over time. And that's kind of an illustration of what we do, right? Um, and uh, yeah, the rest is, you know, uh, it's much less important than hearing the questions that you guys have. And so, so yeah, that's kind of that's kind of us. And so would love to open it up. Uh, questions about you know, Edgewood in particular, what we do, any companies you're interested, in, or also just recruiting. Like you know, I think uh, reflecting back on my own experience when you know I was uh, you know uh, in college, uh, no one gave me the playbook about like what finance was and all the different things you can do within finance, and I had to kind of learn it experientially along the way. So. Um, I'm more than happy to like help dispel any like myths about recruiting or advice about recruiting if that's helpful. But I'm going to shut up now, and so you guys are going to have to talk. Uh, let me, and, and I'm going to stop sharing also. Okay, great. And we can all start right, with yes. Omar. He raised. Yeah. His yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to ask how. How does Edgewood differ from a hedge fund? And you mentioned that a lot of what you do is invest in uh, high growth potential uh, stocks. So how do you also hedge those investments? Yeah, so it's a good question. We, we don't hedge them. So, um, you know, I think there is a mechanical difference with hedge funds and then there's a very big cultural philosophical difference with hedge funds. And I feel I can speak a little bit uh, to this uh, because I worked at a hedge fund for five years before joining Edgewood seven years ago. Uh, and so uh, the mechanical difference is that we invest uh, uh, in companies. We only invest going long in companies. So we only benefit by companies growing over time and those investments growing over time. We do not short sell uh, the stocks of businesses, meaning we don't profit on businesses declining over time. So, you know, ours is what people would call like a naked portfolio, meaning we're just long, which means we have no hedging, which means, you know, if the stocks go down, you know, you know we go down with them. Um, and so that's, I think, the mechanical difference. I think culturally and philosophically, there's a huge, I would say, difference, which is, you know, the, uh, you know, there's no such thing I, as a good or a bad investment firm. It's one that's consistent or inconsistent. Okay. So I think, you know, we have the luxury of having a very unique kind of source of capital. Um, and we have a leadership team that from day one has really prized like a long-term orientation. And so what that means for analysts is that we really have the ability to think long and hard about the companies we investigate, right? So, you know, uh, a, a company like Netflix or more recently that I worked on on Snapchat, like we would have spent 
a year or two years really investigating a business, which is very unique to us. Um, and then we own these businesses for like 10 years. You know, there's companies in our portfolio like American Tower that we've owned for 15 years. And so like our orientation is much more in line with like the Warren Buffetts of the world in practice than it is hedge funds, which I think not because they're like bad people or anything, but just because their capital base is different are kind of compelled to be a little more short-term oriented. They have kind of much shorter lead times and also own businesses for much shorter. And, you know, that's, again, not, neither good nor bad. It's just a different day-to-day -day job, you know? And we kind of have the luxury of kind of thinking more long-term. And I feel like I, I try to liken ourselves less to hedge funds, even though we're classified in the same industry, and more as like business owners. You know, we kind of, we're kind of partners with the founders and entrepreneurs and the leadership teams of these businesses. Um, and we go along uh, on that journey with them, which means, you know, over time for 10 years, as they grow, we benefit. But if they feel the pain, then we hurt too. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, Albord or Medellin, um, you know, uh, 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 either one, whoever wants to go first. I think you raised your hand first. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, awesome. And, and did I did I mispronounce your name? And I'm so sorry for that. Yeah, it's Medjean. Medjean, I'm so sorry. Um, my question is completely different. I realized in the qualifications that it says you have to be a current college sophomore, but I'm a freshman right now. But technically, by the time the internship would start, I would be a sophomore. So I want to know if I still qualify or no. I'll take that one. So we typically hire um, rising juniors. So after you finish your sophomore year, and we do that by design because we think you develop a little bit of experience, whether you actually take finance or accounting classes, or it's just the learning experience at in college um, in general. And also we don't, we don't take juniors. We don't typically take juniors because we think that that's the opportunity to um, get a longer 10 week internship and ours only five week. So sophomore is sort of our sweet spot. Um, that being said, if you don't qualify to apply this year, we would love for you to apply next year. So this is by no means like a one, one shot deal. We can stay in touch and I can give you my email information. I can make sure that you are on our distribution list for next fall so that you can apply the following year. But I do think it's most beneficial for your learning experience and for um, the internship program to keep it at sophomores. Okay, and, thank you. And, uh, you know, we found historically, because we've been doing this for kind of many years, and so now we've had like a, we have a pretty strong, like, alumni group who have gone through the internship program, and I think they would attest to what I'm about to say, which is, you know, having the experience at Edgewood between your sophomore and junior year is really great preparation for some of those kind of more traditional investment banking internships that you do between your junior and senior year. I think it, you know, it prepares you well, it really uh, it, it gives you the chance to do some elevated work. And I think it's so it's sort of tactically and strategically kind of a useful thing to do and prep for that. Uh, Albert. Yes, thank you both so much for being here. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, so you, sp you spoke a lot about uh, you know, pursuing these preemptive, uh, very disrupt disruptive trends. Um, and, you know, I've noticed in the asset management industry currently, it's been a, a large trend toward pursuing, uh, you know, venture capital and private equity deals. So I was wondering if Edgewood uh, has been, you know, considering or, or, you know, pursuing these different kind of uh, private deals. Totally. No, it's a great question. Um, so, no, we haven't. Um, and I think the reason we haven't is I think we believe really strongly in the power of like focus and knowing what your circle of competence is, you know, and that um, just uh, like a, a, a going back to the original analogy of different ways of practicing medicine, although that is still within the investment industry, there is a lot of important nuances that make, you know, VC investing and private investing distinct from what we do. And so, you know, we think it's more valuable to kind of invest in, uh, in the, in our core, which is public equity investing. Uh, you know, it's not, you know, you know, 10 years from now, uh, is it possible that Edgewood has like a private investing arm? Maybe, you can't ever say no, but it would be 
a different team than the team that focuses on public equity investing uh, because it's a bit of a different skill set. Um, and I would say, like on this point, uh, a lot of uh, investors who have tried to drift towards VC or venture capital private investing and have bemoaned the ability to you know earn a return in public equity markets they they claim that it's too hotly competitive and you can't uh, that we would very aggressively refute right our own performance and experience is a great refutation of that right um and you know there are the public equity markets are replete with you know just countless and countless examples of amazing businesses that earn incredible returns over time um you just have to be good at it right and uh um, and uh, um, and also a, an aspect of public equity that I find fascinating is uh, like you also as an investor get to benefit and capitalize on sentiment, right? Like ultimately investing is a, a bunch of people and a bunch, you know, uh, in a bunch of different firms um, making decisions, but they're all human beings, and they uh, turns out they behave quite um, rashly in the short term, and that allows for really big uh, dislocations in uh, the stock prices of companies, which you can really like capitalize on, right? And so like uh, Snapchat is an example, when they went public in 2017, they had a couple of missteps, but because of those missteps and just, just generally them being in, a, in, in an evolutionary phase of their business, the value of their company plummeted by 80%, right? Um, and so that allows you to like buy like a house for 80% off, right? Oh, which is super exciting because it's, if you get it right, those are the opportunities that allow you to generate like, you know, kind of exponential return over time. And as a private investor, you, you don't get the benefit of capitalizing on sentiment because the, the, the valuations or the way things are valued are just basically negotiations and kind of very controlled. Uh, you you don't have um, the, the, the you don't have the ability to capitalize on people's sentiment. Larry Page had a great saying of Google that in the short term um, the stock market is like a voting machine, and in the long term it's like a weighing scale, right? So in the short term, you know the movement of stocks are dictated by the whims of individuals, and it's only over the long term that you know the the value of something is proportionate to its weight or its fundamentals. You know, you can't cheat as much as I try how much you weigh uh, because it's just the reality, right? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. No, 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 um, great question. And yeah, if you, if you, mind, if you don't mind just uh, me asking, um, w uh, which firm did you work at beforehand? I, I ask because I'm gonna be at a hedge fund this summer. Okay, great, yeah. So there is um, a broad network of uh, hedge funds called Tiger Management. Um, and, you know, uh, within them, there's like literally like do do dozens and dozens of, uh, of firms that are part of that umbrella. And so I work within the Tiger Management family of investment of hedge funds. Where are you working this summer? I'll be at point seventy two. Great. Yeah. So they, they, they are uh, obviously a great firm. And I think one that uh, uh, I think it's like amazing, like individuals who work there. Um, but one that's clearly distinct from what we do. And so this just goes to my point, like there's no such thing as a bad or a good firm. It's just, you know, you have to find the investment environment that's consistent with what like makes you tick. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. James and Emily, awesome. Hi, how's it going? Uh, thanks Great. for having me. Um, so you mentioned earlier that your, that your hedge fund doesn't uh, hedge against risk. So how does the the firm actually decide when to uh, open or exit positions? Yeah, um, it, 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 it's all a function of, you know, uh, something hitting a certain inflection point that excites us enough that it warrants investing in, right? And so it's usually easier to figure out uh, when, uh, how to invest in something because it's a function of, again, some company doing something kind of extraordinary in an area that we find very interesting. The tougher thing becomes like, when do you, how do you sell a business, right? And so what makes Edgewood's approach a little unique is that we own a fixed number of stocks. We own a fixed number of companies. We own 22. We don't own 21. We don't own 23. So to get um, a new company into the portfolio, 
we have to sell an existing company, right? So at any given point in time, there are three or four businesses in our kind of pipeline or uh, that are fully you know, researched that are competing and vying for that 20 second spot in the portfolio. And it's, it boils down to the analyst in question pitching those new ideas, whether he or she can demonstrate that they are more attractive ideas than the weakest stock in our portfolio. So there's like sort of a healthy tension or competitive dynamic between you know, new ideas and the existing portfolio. And so do you want to just talk about the buckets at a high level? Like we diversify across growth rates too as a totally, totally, totally. Um, and so for this, I might like re-share the screen because uh, that just might be helpful to illustrate. Um, okay. Sorry, guys, one second. Okay. Okay, um, so um, how we approach the portfolio is that we categorize businesses in one of three buckets, each um, connoting a different earnings growth rate. So we have bucket one with our companies that are growing their profits 10 to 15%, bucket two that are growing profits 16 to 20%, and bucket three that are growing profits north of 20%. And uh, by design, we don't allocate more than a third of our portfolio to each of those three buckets, right? So the way we kind of think about it is bucket one and bucket two combined are like represent two thirds of our portfolio. And they are, rep they are comprised of businesses that are kind of more mature, more dominant franchises that will kind of consistently grow year after year. So there's kind of less opportunity for exponential upside, but there's also a lot of uh, durability. So, you know, think of Microsoft or, you know, uh, Visa or Adobe or Nike, um, Estee Lauder. Um, and then bucket three are uh, businesses that, you know, are much earlier in their evolution or in their life cycle as companies. So, you know, I point to examples like Align or, uh, or again, Snapchat, where, uh, these are businesses that are just younger and have a lot more potential upside, and yet they also have more risk. And so you know, I think what makes us unique is that our, our portfolio comprises both types of investments, kind of your kind of uh, very durable ballast investments, and as well as your kind of sexier, you know, juice investments. Yeah, I had a follow-up question. So like, why... Uh, specifically 22 investments. So obviously like, diversification is like a popular investment method, but like why 22 specifically? Yeah. Yeah. So I think we would sort of push back against the idea that diversification is like the best approach to investing. I would just asterisk that if you're investing for like your own personal uh, uh, income, first of all, I'm not giving investment advice, but I, I feel like I need to address this, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, if you aren't doing this as a professional, as a day-to-day -day where you like have the resources and the time to focus like, and know a company in and out, then the best thing you can do is just own an extremely diversified index fund um, and let that, you know, and put it, uh, you know, uh, invest in it, go to sleep, and then, uh, you know, l l wake up 30 years from now and see it pay you so much uh, dividends. Um, but if you're a professional investor, we actually will push very hard against the idea of diversification, right? Uh, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, there, there's a lot of academics that's been dedicated to this subject, but you know, beyond like twenty-ish stocks, like the marginal utility of that incremental idea gets really diluted. You know, the twenty-fifth and thirtieth and thirty-fifth stock really doesn't add that much to your portfolio. Right, and it's only when you have a focused amount of portfolio that they can move the needle to your overall performance. All right, so I think we would push back against the idea of diversification and uh, really embrace the idea of concentration. Right now, the follow-up question you'll ask, well, like, okay, that's great, but then why aren't you? Why don't you only have five stocks, or why don't you only have ten stocks? Right. So I think there's no right answer to this. I think you know it's a sliding scale. Obviously, the less number of stocks you have, 
the more your performance is swayed by individual stocks, right? And so like what we strive to do is to create a balance, which is that we have a, a small number of stocks that can still move the needle and drive the overall portfolio, but, but there be enough that if one blows up, it doesn't sink the entire ship, okay? So that's why I think 20-ish, is um, like the appropriate number. And this is substantiated with like, you know, decades of like, you know, corporate finance theory. The, fu the funny question is why is it 22 as opposed to 21? And it might be, and it might be something to do with our president, uh, I think wearing the number 22 jersey when he was at Emory University back in the day. And also our corporate logo has 22 hash signs and it would just, be way too expensive to change that now. So we're stuck with 22. Um, good. Thank you. Uh, Emily, I want to uh, get to you. You've been waiting. You've been so kind to be patient. Oh, well, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the perspective and the insights. That was very interesting. And thank you both for taking time out of your busy day to talk to us. To, um, a sophomore at Brewer College studying economics. And my question for you guys is, what are, you, what, are, what are the recruiters looking for when hiring interns? What are some specific qualities that you look for on the resume? Um, I think one of the most important um, qualities is curiosity, okay? It's um, uh, an, an enthusiasm um, and a personal drive to learn, right? Um, and a lot of what we do is like pulling uh, the thread. Like we read something, read a book, we talk to someone, we watch a movie, we read something in the newspaper, we follow something on social media and it starts like the wheels turning. Um, and, and then we kind of dive into uh, and obsess about that topic. And I think there's no magic to what we do, right? Um, we're not... Uh, you know, rocket scientists by any stretch. But I think what we're really good at is like this obsession and drive to dig deep on something that has sparked our interest. And so, you know, in our experience, you know, so much of this is teachable, like the analytics, like how we go about our process, the 22 stocks, the concentration, et cetera. But what is sort of not teachable in, in our view is, you know, do you have that thirst to learn? And I think regardless of whatever background you're coming from, if you can demonstrate a thirst to learn, I think that is probably one of the biggest determinants of success in the investment industry. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I think, uh, you know, if I'm on the topic, you know, another thing that's unique to us uh, is, you know, unlike almost all other investment firms, we really um, make all of our investment decisions on, uh, on a team basis, right? So what that means is, you know, we don't have like one individual who I go pitch a stock to who then decides whether the stock gets invested in or not. We have um, a team of 11 investment professionals, okay? Um, of which we all vote on making investments, okay? So I think another kind of foundational element is uh, how good are you in working with other people, right? And so like, uh, I think team orientation is a great buzzword that gets thrown around in recruiting. Um, but, uh, but I think we really, if you're, if you're unable to work with other people and you're, if you're too individualistic, again, it's neither good nor bad, it's just not the right fit for us. And so I would think, I would say like, you know, the two really important things would be curiosity and, and team orientation. But that's just my perspective would be, I'd love to hear what Juliana has to say. <laughs> um, I would say, so the number one thing is always intellectual curiosity. So you uh, covered that already, Sad. I also just like to clarify, because I know other internships have specific requirements. We do not have any sort of major requirement, class experience, GPA. We'd like to see, I mean, you know, cliche, we like to see a well-rounded candidate. We like to see somebody who just really wants to learn. And the last thing I'll say, um, I do agree with everything Sad said, but is this is a, uh, you also in a different sense of being team oriented, you have to be an independent worker. So that meaning we assign, so we treat the interns like they're analysts for the summer or for the five weeks. And we say that you're going to research, I don't know, Illumina, you need to learn everything about it. And then you have to pitch it to the investment team. 
and nobody stands there and measures your project, uh, pro, pro, your process or your progress. I just combine those two words. Um, you just have to, I always say you get as much out of the Edgewood internship as you're willing to put in. So um, that's just, I mean, hardworking, everybody wants a hard worker, but it's being able to work independently without constant guidance. And then of course, asking questions when you have them. Um, a combination of that is what makes a good intern. So definitely apply, Emily, sophomore, love to hear that. <laughs> I'll definitely look into the application after this meeting. Um, yeah, and then like a really interesting opportunity. Yeah, definitely. And let me know if you have any other questions about the application. Omar, you have your hand raised again. You're also yeah, polite so, with hand uh, raising. I know. Uh, I've sort of been holding this question in since um, uh, Saad answered my question, my first question. And um, you mentioned something about uh, Edgewood having a unique um, source of income. Uh, and that you raise your funds differently than how a hedge fund would raise their funds. And that sort of allows Edgewood to adopt a different investment strategy where, you know, you only have 22 um, stocks that you invest in mm -hmm. and hold them long term. Uh, can mm -hmm. you explain more how, how it's unique and what exactly, how, to, how it works? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a great question. And I might have to get a little in the weeds. So if I lose everyone, it's all your fault, Omar. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if you want to invest for 10 years, you have to have customers who are willing to be with you for 10 years and that they don't leave at the first sign of any like variability in your performance, right? So the goal is to have as long-term oriented customers as you can, okay? And so well, what we have is a big, big source, the big, single biggest source of our capital, okay? is if you are someone who is of a certain means, like this is this was all completely new to me because you know I grew up not in this country, I'm from Pakistan and I came from a very like normal background, but you know, there are there is a massive industry, okay, of people who have a certain amount of net worth, you know, in the, you know, oh, let's call it over five hundred thousand dollars of like of, of savings. Okay. They have uh, they keep their money in banks, right? And they have access to um, something called private client networks, all right? So each of these banks like JP Morgan has a division within it where they take uh, the Omars of the world and the Emilys of the world who have in excess of $500,000 in savings and then help them invest uh, that money, okay? And so we, a big unlock in our business over the last 10, 15 years was that we were able to get onto the platforms of these private client networks so that when, you know, Omar, the next Omar walked into JP Morgan and said, I have $500,000 to invest. That portfolio manager at JP Morgan said, okay, I'm going to put X percent of your money into U.S. equity growth. Okay. And then we would be one of the preferred funds, one of maybe four, and then we would get our sliver of those flows. So the single biggest source of our capital, there are many, but the single biggest source are basically these private banks from the companies you've heard of JP Morgan Bank and Merrill Lynch and although they show up as individual accounts they really are the uh, they're, they're basically the uh, you know many thousands of people all put together like those individual high net worth people okay what happens is that when they invest in our firm and we do well by them and let's say you put in a hundred bucks and that hundred bucks is worth 500 bucks you know for them to sell, they would incur a massive tax bill, right? And they really are trying to accumulate as much wealth, oftentimes to be able to pass on to their next generation or perhaps they're a pension fund, right? Um, and so they're very tax sensitive. And so that creates like this inertia against selling and it, it, and it, it sort of creates this motivation to stay with us because the more they stay with us, the more they're, in a hundred bucks has gone up, which means the more taxes they're going to have to pay. And so the, the more inertia against selling. So there is, uh, there's this kind of um, uh, switching cost, if you will, or stickiness that motivates uh, our customers to stay with us for long periods of time. So being able to stay with us for long periods of time um, allows us to have um, the confidence that if we invest in something and or, or that if our performance was to go down in any, any given period of time, that's okay because they're motivated to stay with us for a long period of time, right? And so, for example, uh, 
uh, as I mentioned, I'm uh, uh, the lead analyst on our investment in Snapchat. Snapchat happened to report a quarterly earnings several weeks ago that were, how do you say, not so bueno, right? And so the stock fell 30%, right? And so I think what makes us unique relative to like a hedge fund is at that time, you know, we don't have that itch that, oh my God, we need to sell now to minimize the pain because our clients are going to flee. We have the ability to sort of sit with it for some period of time and really investigate in it because our clients are sticking with us. That's, I would say, like the mechanistic or structural reason why we're able to invest longer term. That's been really amplified again by the leadership of the firm that from day one, we have been training our clients that this is what we do. So you have that kind of uh, initial or like overarching kind of approach. And then you have like the reinforcement by our CEO and our senior uh, members of the portfolio team that when we've been meeting with clients and pitching ourselves, like we have been consistent in like preaching long-term orientation day after day after day for, you know, 15, 20 years. And so I think uh, clients have been, re that's been reinforced. And that's, I think, kind of the, why we are able to do what we do. Now, I'm going to like continue, finish the thread, the, the really important point. And I think this is, if you abstract out, really important when you evaluate opportunities, you know, this summer or and down the road, you, you really need to uh, vet and validate that the organizations you're going to choose to like dedicate your careers to, do they have a, do they have a consistency? Right. So like, you know, we can be wanting to be long term more investors as much as we want. But uh, do we walk the walk in addition to talking the talk? Right. Do we have the right structure in place with our customers? Uh, do we have the right, um, you know, uh, like trumpeting by our leadership team? Have we hired the right investment professionals who are similarly inclined to or uh, to invest long term? Right. So consistency is big. Um, James. Uh, you, uh, you got another one. Yeah, so you just mentioned. Um, you muted out. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, you're disqualified. You can't use Zoom, <laughs> so you can't apply. No, I'm just kidding. All right, yeah. um, so you just mentioned briefly about like the quarter three uh, earnings of Snapchat. Yeah. So when, you, when you're when you reevaluating, you know, your holding of the stock and uh, that coincide with the fact that you own 22 stock, 22 stocks how how much does that affect your like position your just the decision to like sell like you also yeah. mentioned that no rush to sell yeah exactly so i think well you know uh, I, I think our approach is you know we go the way the information and evidence is going right and so you know a, a stock dropping definitely reawakens our need to validate this new information we've taken in right um but uh, we try to be kind of very systematic in it and like minimize our bias, okay? So there's two extremes that are unhealthy in this the Snapchat situation. One extreme is, you know, I've obsessed about it for the last three years of my life. I'm gonna think they're never can do anything wrong. So I'm just gonna be like, oh, it's all good. And, you know, let's go for it, right? That's one extreme that's unhealthy. The other extreme is like, oh my God, the stock's down 30% and like uh, I'm freaking out and I need to sell it because the world's ending. And that is equally unhealthy. So what we try to do is systematize not doing that. Okay, and how do we not do that? So we have like, I think, which is again, pretty unique. We have a reassignment process. When something like that happens, um, the responsibility for the stock is taken out of the person's hands who's the original author of the stock and been reassigned to someone else on the investment team. So I think that really addresses the bias where like, you know, we uh, we're not going to uh, we're not going to just like uh, uh, roll our eyes and assume everything is OK because I'm not the one making the decision. Um, it's in someone else's hand who doesn't have that historical baggage. Right. Uh, the second thing uh, that we do is like that decision, whether or not to kind of double down or whether to sell the stock is not made by that one sole person. There's a vote for the entire team. Right. And so. I think it really minimizes the chance that we're going to be responding to someone who's just freaking out, right? So, you know, to answer your question, we reassign the stock to someone else in the investment team, and then we re like evaluate it in light of the new circumstances. And I would say, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe 40% of the time, 40 to 50% of the time, we learned that you know something has changed and uh, our investment thesis has fundamentally been altered and we should sell the stock and maybe like 50 to 60 percent of the time it's like well you know 
something changed, but not so dramatically. And so we should really use this time to actually not just continue owning the stock, but maybe buy more of the stock uh, uh, and, and kind of benefit from the opportunity. Yeah, I think you bring up a really great point about uh, reevaluating the fund fundamental thesis about Snapchat because, you know, with going on with uh, app the Apple's change, like privacy settings, I think their business model does kind of, you know, shift in a different direction. So, yeah, I think it's yeah. great that uh, the the stock is like re reallocated to someone else to revalue. Yep. Yeah. And again, like, you know, this is why Mr. Buffett says like between IQ and EQ, you know, EQ is way more important to be successful in the investment industry. Right. And uh, the key is just, if you can work in a firm uh, that can minimize bias, like there's a very high probability of success in that firm. And so I'm grateful to be in an environment where there's a big focus on that. If you don't ask me, Asi, do you still have a high conviction on Snapchat? Uh, I don't know, Julie. I'll defer to you Julie. Know what? We, we don't have enough time to talk about his conviction in Snapchat. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah. Um, I don't even know if I should answer that question. But yes, I think so. I can say that, right? Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. I, uh, yes. I have super high conviction in Snapchat. Um, and, uh, um, and yes. And I think we, we have to like, we have a pretty high degree of confidence of where they're going five years from now. Um, and we just need to like understand if the road from here to then is going to be a little rockier than we thought otherwise. But, you know, again, I, we don't try to think what our opinion is. What we've been doing is talking to advertisers and understanding how they're reacting to these latest changes in Apple. Um, and, uh, and it's so far, it seems, you know, that they're not really turning away from the platform. No, thank you so much. Okay, Giannina, I, I know we're a little over time. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to take over your whole night and maybe you kids have homework or something. Yeah, no, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Um, I did put a link in the chat. If everyone could please, before you leave, just click that link and fill it out. Um, it really helps us create more programs like this and information sessions like this with great partners like Edgewood. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thanks everyone. Thanks um, for the great questions. Uh, yeah, and uh, we hope you're you know intrigued enough to hopefully apply and you know and if any of you have questions about the application process, please reach out to us. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.